Thanks. So thank you for inviting me and um, thanks for the last two uh, presentations. And I'm actually going to be pulling out some of the themes that um, we talked about first in the first presentation about um, should open source software be um, that's funded by research councils? Should, 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 should software that's funded by research councils be open source? And also looking at the kind of dynamics of open source communities. So firstly, just, um, just to say, I work at the Institute of Development Studies at the University of Sussex. Um, and I'm gonna start off just talking a little bit about me and my journey. And I'm partly talking about my journey because it's always interesting to hear these things and also because of what I'm gonna be talking about. That I'm gonna be talking about how we kind of redress the currently not, not very healthy gender balance um, in open source communities and in, in technology more generally. So I'm gonna show my um, age that I um, started working in the, in the tech sector in the mid 1990s. Uh, using Photoshop 3, which probably dates me. And during that time, I was often the only woman in male dominated workplaces. Um, I worked, I helped create the UK's first um, online pizza delivery service in Brighton in about 1996, 1997. So that's a claim to fame. And then after the dot com crash about 20 years ago, I moved into a, a non profit sector working with. And a lot of that time I spent working with open source communities because we, um, I worked with an NGO called Tactical Tech and we used to make toolkits of open source tools aimed at um, human rights defenders and people and activists. And the reason we used open source tools were that they were free and also that they were translatable. So tools like digital security tools, which might not, um, commercial tools, which might only be available in say English and French that you could translate them into languages like Farsi, so Iranian human rights defenders could use them. And then I went and did a, PH, a master's and a PhD in the Open University, and I don't know if we've got any Open University people in the house, and um, what a great institution it is. And I was lucky enough to do my PhD in the Department of Commu Computing and Communications. And um, inadvertently or advertently, it's a department with really, really strong female leadership and, a re and some really good numbers about um, uh, women, sort of, sort of female academics working there. And I also had um, PhD supervisor, Clem Herman, who's a great advocate for women in technology. And then I also ran a, a meetup called 300 Seconds Brighton with a couple of friends, which was aimed at um, getting, helping more women speakers at tech conferences. And what we do is Give them a kind of dry run just in front of a few friends to help them build their confidence to speak in front of kind of techie audiences and then we just have a kind of friendly meetup in brighton which is a big kind of digital town um, and it was really good fun and it was a really great community and now i um lead digital research at the institute of development studies uh which is number one in the world for development studies along with the university of sussex and it's also an international number one international development think tank so we do a lot of uh, research which is aimed not just purely academic research but research which is aimed at policy makers and now my research and policy focus is on digital inequalities and gender and i also work on online uh, addressing online gender-based violence. Oh, yeah. But today I'm going to be talking about some research we carried out two years ago for the Digital Impact Alliance, which is a big um, advocate for open source. It's part of the UN Foundation and it's funded by the UN and it's funded by the Gates Foundation as well, as well as some other funders, um, Swedish CEDA. And because of they, they champion the use of open source tools for development projects. So these will be tools that are aimed at mobile health. So your uh, tools for like data connection in remote areas on a feature phone, um, those kind of tools or tools. So the Gates Foundation, for example, funds a lot of uh, tools for kind of microfinance platforms. And Dial were concerned that the the software tools that they were funding and the tools that were being developed, the open source tools that were being developed by this community, weren't, there wasn't a gender balance in the communities that were developing them. 
And so they commissioned us at IDS to do some research about this and to figure out the, the big picture of what was going on and some strategies to help fix this. I talked to women about what had worked for them, what had really made a difference for them. And this we were building on um, existing research that um, my colleagues had carried, my colleague Evangelia Burdu had carried out her PhD on open source software and other research which had shown that how that communities like GitHub, for example, I think had like 3% of female contributors. And actually we even saw that in some of the pictures uh, that Dilma was showing um, earlier that you could just do a kind of visual, like, yeah, there was probably about three women in the, three or four women in the, the, the Linux picture there. So why is it good to have diverse open source teams? I mean, it's, um, you produce software that, I mean, research shows this, it's not just a kind of, yes, it would be a good thing that you produce software that's not gender biased, it uses male and female pronouns, excludes images that objectify women. That one of the classic stories I think is about like the original iPhone kind of health functionality didn't use an app for tracking your menstrual cycle. And as any menstruating woman would tell you, it's actually one of the few useful things a health app can do on a mobile phone is tell you when uh, your period's about to start. And so having women in the room is really important for just creating inclusive software. Um, so it encourages gender positive projects that promote social change. So it, in it, apart from being in and of itself. Um, so when it comes to the kind of software that Dial are interested in, so that's uh, software aimed at use in development contexts, in humanitarian contexts, it, it means that you're what, having a more diverse team. It means that they produce software products that hopefully deliver better development outcomes, that they produce tools that uh, can be used for both uh, male and female communities. So we interviewed uh, 24 women and uh, some male, interview male interviewees who worked for different kind of software projects as well, all around the world, um, including Madagascar's only female open source software developer. We um, interviewed quite a few women in India and in Kenya, which is a in Kenya is a really big hub. Um, and we talked to them about their experiences and what were the kind of enablers and barriers. And we were talking to women at all, all stages, really, women who were kind of young and who were kind of intern stages. We talked to women who were um, oh, women who were working on not just in kind of conventional open source platforms, but also women who are working on the kind of open platforms that Dawn was just talking about, like um, OpenStreetMap and OpenStreetMap's got a kind of humanitarian version called Humanitarian OpenStreetMap. We also interviewed women who are working in organisations like Prykelt in South Africa, which are kind of funding open source projects, just to understand what their experiences were and what we could what we could learn from them. And we learnt a lot, which kind of reinforced what we already know from years of research about women's experiences in, in technology more generally and working in computing more generally. So one of the most important things is that understanding this intersectionally that for women from lower socioeconomic backgrounds who are, for, who are from my kind of minority groups were even more challenging than, the, than their other kind of richer whiter counterparts. Um, women talked about having to leave their gender behind to fit in. And I can remember that from my own experiences as a kind of 20 something working in games companies in Brighton in the 1990s, that you have to kind of be one of the boys. Um, women talked about quite hostile online communication, like quite kind of savage tone on mailing lists and um, in the kind of communities as well. Because of the care responsibilities that women have, um, they didn't have enough time to contribute effectively, and they also didn't have a lot of time and space to and sort of safe spaces to learn and, and to, to, to get things wrong um, and to be supported. Um, so women talked about having to put in extra effort to achieve the same level of recognition as their male counterparts. This woman saying that makes me depressed that a woman will do five hours work and get appreciation. I have to do 10 hours to get the same appreciation. I have to work more hours than my male counterparts. I think this was a contributor from Kenya who was saying this. 
And the people we've been talked a lot about these kind of soft skills. So it's about um, which is kind of confidence and the communication thing and that kind of resilience to stand up to um, kind of criticisms. So this woman said it's never a skills problem when women with poor backgrounds progress through training programs designed to help them. They get stuck at junior level positions despite being qualified to apply for more senior roles because they don't believe they have the necessary skills to succeed. So it's that thing. And I think you find this in um, technical spaces that women more generally that women won't might not apply for a job that they're not quite qualified for. But men would just go ahead and apply anyway. So. I'm just going to talk, I'm going to be quite quick tonight because I, I would really like to sort of welcome discussions and contributions. So in this research, I would I would urge you to download the research paper and read it. I promise it's not an academic a kind of a overwhelming piece of research. Hopefully it's readable and useful. And we've got a series of recommendations in there for different communities for open source um, communities which I'm going to come on to in a minute but there's also recommendations for funders there's recommendations for the companies themselves um, so I would urge you to read it because there's lots of the kind of crunchy detail and the kind of more evidence but the most useful thing that I think came out of this research is this this framework and it's just it's a it's a tool really for understanding all the different initiatives promoting women in open source and what the kind of changes they bring about so in my own life, I've been part of lots of these different kinds of initiatives from the kind of uh, the 300 seconds work where we did kind of mentoring and helping women develop their speaking skills. At the Open University, one of the things the Open University does really well, it does has a really good Athena Swan program, but it also did things for PhD for women PhD students in any kind of STEM subjects where we got we got special coaching and we got days of training to help us kind of envisage what our career was going to be like after we did our PhDs. And I've, and I've also been part of um, different kinds of initiatives. I've kind of done mentoring myself and I've been mentored. So, and I've done things like um, going to MozFest and participating in kind of communities at MozFest. So I realise there's a whole range of initiatives and the whole kind of things that you can do and that we talk about in our in our research and women had told us their experiences about. But what kind of changes do they bring about? And we thought it'd be useful to develop this this framework. And it's based on existing academic research that was done by my partner, my partner, my colleague, Tony Roberts, who is the co-author of this report. So it's called Conformist, Reformist, Transformist. And conformist initiatives just help you cope, really, to and accommodate themselves to existing unequal gender relations. So they're just they're designed to help women cope. And reformist initiatives can kind of help change in existing unequal gendered social relations with, without really tackling the underlying story. And transformist initiatives are the big story. They're about they can identify and transform unequal power structures. What we don't say is that one of these is better than the other. We need we need all of these. And I know that from, from my own life. So when I had um, we got these special sessions that were for just for, for women STEM students at the Open University, they could seem to be quite conformist. It was absolutely brilliant. It made a massive difference to my kind of academic career afterwards. And it was really, really great. So what we're not saying is that one's better than the other, but it's just a way of thinking through different things that we might do in the communities we work with. So I'm just going to kind of go through some of a bit of analysis of what these different initiatives might look like um, in real life. Um, and this is drawing on some of the examples that came up in the research that we did. So conformist things are things like conference bursaries. So some of the women we talked to had got bursaries to go to the Google called Google, Sum Google Summer of Code mentoring, learning about the backstory and the long history of women in computer science. Um, all of that can kind of help you feel like you're part of a kind of longer story, that you do have a role in these communities. Voluntary data collection, so just getting communities to kind of voluntarily kind of count how many women or how many people of colour or how many people from 
different sort of diverse backgrounds are represented in their communities, that can be conformist because it's voluntary. Reformist could be things like designing this, <laughs> online networks and conference sessions for women in open source, particularly in the global south. And some of the women we talked to who were around a network called the Asakana network in Zambia, they had, so that's a tech hub in Zambia, in Lusaka, and they had different women coming from other um, sort, of, sort of neighboring and nearby African countries that would come and kind of hang out and kind of build networks. And so building that kind of social capital was really important. Um, codes of conduct, quite common now for if you part of, sort of take part in a conference, you'll have to sign up to a code of conduct. Women coders in schools, some of the um, women we talked to in Southeast Asia, they'd done things where they'd got their members from, from their community to go and from their women in tech network to go and like just hang out in secondary schools and give talks to teenage girls to show them that um, careers in technology were really good. Yeah, workplace students, paid internships. So there's been a lot of hoo-ha in the UK actually about unpaid internships, but if you have a paid internships, it means that you can diversify your workplace because it means that there's no barrier to participating. Transformers, the big one. How do you really transform these things? Um, one of the things which I haven't put on here was about, it was about what we call critical consciousness. And if you forgive the kind of terrible academic terminology, that's about having conversations and it's about men and women realizing what they can do and transforming their own understanding, what, they, what the roles they can play. So Dawn was just talking about the fact that she's convening this, an open network, which is a kind of voluntary network, which is kind of bringing different people together. And that's like, she's playing a role in making this community different, through having a kind of critical consciousness that something, bringing these people together could be, could be um, more productive and fruitful. Um, but other things you can do is having, open access publishing of pay and diversity audit, audits, a condition of funding and contracting. So I know there are certain laws in the UK about um, publishing your sort of ge the gender pay gap. And it's just, it's brilliant because it's a kind of quick fire way of, as a, as a woman, if you're thinking, oh, I'm sure I'm gonna go and work at this company, oh, that gender pay gap's not looking too great. Um, maybe I won't go and work there. Or it's a way of companies yeah, showcasing the fact that they're, they're working really hard on this. So I think that kind of open access publishing, and it also means that you can then aggregate that data out and you can produce league tables, um, getting gender parity in senior positions of power and control. So actually having women having women at the top can make a, make a massive difference. And there was a kind of much tweeted example about uh, the, the women leaders around the world who've been managing the <laughs> coronavirus pandemic much better. Policies which change gendered social norms. Gendered social norms are things like, um, we had a contributor to our research who was from somewhere in West Africa, I can't remember where, maybe Senegal, was. she was talking about how she was part of a an open street map community and the guys made her cook dinner. She was like, she They'd work together during the day and then the evening she'd be in charge of cooking the dinner. So anything which sort of makes it clear that those kind of um, behaviours are unacceptable, that um, it's, you could only be part of this community if you absolutely don't behave in a, in a sexist or racist fashion, then those <clears throat> policies which exclude on the in, or include on the basis of um, uh, your behaviour is really important and people are actually getting trained because a lot of the time people I think there is there are occasions when people don't realize that they might be using language which is actually a bit dodgy or a bit offensive and people it's, it's quite awkward having to be the person who pulls everybody up on this language so actually just walking people through it makes a massive difference and just saying actually and not making that an individual's responsibility. So not making it the woman in the single woman in the workplace's job to be the person who has to pull somebody up on kind of sexist or inappropriate language, just making it part of the kind of um, your inclusion criteria. Like I know now at, 
in my institute, we have to do safeguarding training. So just thinking about it, it's, it's something like that. It's just something that you kind of comply with to be part of a community or to be part of a workplace. So this is just really a snapshot of quite a kind of in-depth piece of research and a snapshot of a very kind of complex picture of um, lots of different kinds of um, strategies which you can take to make your workplaces and communities more inclusive. And like I said, I don't think, I don't want people to think, oh, I'm not going to do something if it's conformist, because that's that's nonsense, because mentoring and role models are so important in actually giving people money to get them to conferences, which we might think, oh, it's just conformist, it's just helping women cope more. Helping one woman cope better and kind of flourish in a in a workplace is absolutely brilliant. So don't I don't want people to be go away thinking that there's something that, that uh, one of these is better than the other. We need a combination of all of them and there's overlap between them. So it's just a kind of schema for thinking about things. So as I mentioned within the um, report, we, we made a series of recommendations and I'm just pulling out here the recommendations for open source communities because I thought those, this is what I'm the community that I'm talking to. So three here about building online peer support networks, moderating online forums to kind of raise awareness among men and women about the benefits of diversity and inclusion in software development. So kind of organizing proactive measures. So again, this is <laughs> this evening is a proactive measure and um, uh, things like uh, I was just talking about like going to schools, not that you can do that at the moment, but things like going to schools and sitting down with a group of teenage girls and saying that you could have a really good career in software and you can, because I think those, the other thing that really came out in our research is how this starts in the, it starts at um, primary school. I'm working with a really great team at the moment on another project, um, a team of computer scientists at Makarewa University in Kampala in Uganda. And there's a great uh, uh, woman program there, Mary, who's developing an Internet of Things uh, weather station. And she just said, and I said, oh, it's, re it's, it's really unusually female dominated <laughs> department. And she just said, yeah, my, my dad just always encouraged us girls to go off and do technical things. And I think realising that proactive measures like just encouraging girls to get into kind of um, sort of technical of technical um, jobs and working and encouraging them to be creative in STEM projects is really, really important. You can't, you can't start too young with these things. And then also one of the other recommendations is to kind of reflect on your own community and just thinking about, well, what's the kind of language you're using and um, making sure that what, what could we do better to um, Kind of reflect on and talk to people in your communities to understand like what might be making them feel uncomfortable is there certain kind of hostile language that's being used or kind of modes of communication that might be excluding people so that's just a kind of snapshot of some of the recommendations that we pulled out um and again i'm, I'm not i don't think any of this is rocket science um this is building on years of research that uh, women like my supervisor Clem Herman had been doing in software communities for years um, and there's some really good research both on open source communities and on computing more generally um, but this is these are just some recommendations and some ways of thinking about um, how we might make these communities more open and inclusive. Oh yeah something else secure buy-in about codes of conduct Escalating sanctions for anyone who abuses other community measures. Um, yeah, anti-harassment training and awareness raising. Um, just again, so it's not one, it's not the victim's job to call people out. It becomes everybody's job and it becomes, um, it becomes as much the job of the men in that community to call out um, sexism and harassment as it is the woman's job. And I think that's really, really important. And I think that's actually, um, involve uh, realizing that men are about getting men involved in fixing this is really really important it's not it's not women's job to fix this it's everybody's job to create healthy communities so yeah thank you very much and um, thank you for giving me some of your time on this September evening thank you very much
Thank you very much, Thank Becky. You, Thank you, uh, so, as ever, questions on the questions panel or hands up or tweet at us um, at BCS OSSG. Um, one, one from me, Becky. Do you think there's more that the kind of I guess legislation could do. So we've seen stuff recently around gender pay gap, mm. um, which I I think and I hope is pretty positive. Um, yeah. What more could be done from like a policy perspective to to help this issue? I think this, is, this might be a bit of a weird response, but I think um, making higher education more affordable. So I think one of the barriers is about yeah. Um, yeah, tuition fees just being really expensive. And in my time at the Open University, I was at the OU when the tuition fees really went up. So anything uh, that makes education more affordable. Um, so I think that really, really helps. And I think anything, yeah, so I think anything that's like the gender pay gap where companies are forced to produce open data and be transparent about the gender and ethnicity mix. I mean, we have the same problem in academia when it comes to um, black, black academics, that they're, um, it's like ridiculously bad, the amount of um, black, black academics we have in senior positions in the UK. But we only know this because universities actually have to publish this data. So anything which is about opening up that data and, and companies being being made to kind of publish this information. I think things, legislation around flexible working, I mean, we're all working flexibly now and it's a bit of a nightmare, so I should be saying this, but um, something companies actually now, which is good, a good thing about the pandemic, are now realising that actually you can work from home and work flexibly. Um, a lot. I've, did, I've done other research on um, gender gaps in big scientific projects for UNESCO, and one of the things that came up there was about hey, childcare. So just having affordable childcare makes a big difference for some for some sort of lab leaders who kind of made sure that there was a, a nursery on on campus. Things just things like that, which you might, if you kind of very long term investments and quite prosaic, actually I think make a big difference. That's quite a shopping list. Thank you. Any more questions for Becky? No, I think we are at the end. Okay. Thank oh. you. Wait, could I ask you one question, Becky? Do you, do you think it would be useful if open source projects would publish their diversity data and gender gap uh, participation rates, etc.? Yeah, I do. What do you think we'd find? Uh, well, <laughs> I think we'd find a very low percentage of uh, diversity within these groups, but at least it would make it visible. Yeah, that's it. It's making these things, it's making these things visible. And then when, once the data's out there and it's out there in open formats, then you can do things with it. And then you can start to uh, do comparative data and say, well, is there, are there better? What's the story? Is the games industry any better? Are there different industries which are better? Are there different? I mean, one of the interesting things that we found is, is about positive deviance. So we found that there were countries and areas of the world where actually it was much easier to be a woman in an open source community or in the tech community more generally. So in some countries in the Middle East, in India, it's now become a kind of um, research is showing it's become a kind of a really good career for like middle class girls to go into software engineering. So we can learn a lot from the positive deviance as well. But yes, to uh, publishing uh, gender data. Uh, and I think we learned that through Athena Swan as well yeah. in the universities. Yeah. 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 I really enjoyed all your talk and I've enjoyed all the other talks tonight. I think they fit together because we know Louise is like a one-man band with uh, her work in uh, 
uh, text, Jim. And uh, of course, uh, women in engineering are few and far between. And then we went on to the Linux kernel, where again, we have a few women, but not that many. And then you've really pointed us at the wider issues, and I've really enjoyed all that. So thank you to all our speakers. And we also have a, a video from uh, uh, Irina Polkonsky, who wasn't able to uh, give her talk tonight, but it's enabled all our other speakers to give a much, a slightly uh, longer talk. And I really enjoyed them all, and I'm sure everyone else did too. So thank you, all of you. Yeah, that's my hand clap on behalf of the whole audience. <laughs> and uh, just let me put in a, a uh, we've got two AGMs coming up for bro both our groups. Uh, we've got the open source AGM coming up in October. It's an open mic. So if you want to present something on open source at our open mic, you're welcome to. And, oh, sorry. It's it's not on the 17th, but coming up. Yeah, so it's my bad. I'll, I'll get the right date. It's okay. It's coming up in October. And also BCS Women have their AGM coming up. And our speaker for the night will be Rebe Rebecca George, who's the president of the BCS. So the BCS in recent years has had quite a few women as presidents. Uh, and... Uh, so it's another chance for you to engage. And uh, thank you, everyone who came along tonight.